Every day, thousands of people pass by this marvelous example of early modernist architecture without giving it a second thought. But fortunately, someone did, and it's recently been beautifully restored. And it's now the delightfully named Saint-Julien restaurant. As well as the restaurant Saint-Julien, it is also home to the Bacchus wine bar. And in fact, the building has always been a place that has supplied necessary sustenance of one sort or another. It originally was the water boat office of Messrs Hammers & Co, whose job it was to supply fresh water to the ships that put into Singapore Harbour. Now, all the history books say that the building dates from 1919, but I don't really believe that. This kind of modernist architecture didn't appear in Singapore until about 1930. And in fact, if you look at the architectural records for 1919, you'll see a completely different building with a pitched roof. So I think this particular version dates from a little later. Now the ships that Messrs Hammers & Co supplied with water were anchored out there in the inner harbour or else beyond in the Singapore roads. And every day hundreds, if not thousands of lighters went out from the mouth of the Singapore River to load and offload their cargoes. The latter they brought back up the river to the warehouses and go-downs that lined its bank. Now I hope you're up for a bit of time travel because we're going over there behind the Fullerton building and back about 180 years in time. Quite pleasurable and entirely painless experience, I assure you. Now we're starting our colonial jaunt at Johnson's Pier. That's it over there. In the 19th century, it jutted out to sea opposite Battery Road. It was named after Alexander Laurie Johnson, who was a close friend of Stamford Raffles and arrived here in Singapore soon after him in 1819. He founded the settlement's first European trading house in 1820 on Boat Quay and then moved to a more spacious seafront location. That's Johnson's premises behind me and they stood there on the corner of Battery Road until the very end of the 19th century whereupon the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank took over the site and constructed this splendid Gothic confection. And just to remind you exactly where we are, here is the same area today with the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank directly behind me, and on my right, the Fullerton Hotel. And this is what the approach to Kavanagh Bridge looked like in the 1880s. Now the building that you see there was called Flint's Building. I'll tell you a bit more about Captain Flint shortly. The site, however, was subsequently home to the four stories Whiteways and Laidlaw department store. Whiteways and Laidlaw was certainly a popular shopping venue in its day, though it never seriously rivaled John Little's or Robinson's round the corner in Raffles Place. A couple of extra stories were added in the early 60s, and with a bit of renovation and cladding, the building evolved into the Milan bank chambers. And this is what is here today. It's still the same bank, Maybank, but in a rather different packaging. And just around the corner, down on the riverside, we find old Alexander Johnston having a chat to a couple of local worthies, immortalized in bronze, or some such material. But what of Captain Flint, who gave his name to that earlier building which stood on the Maybank site? Is he equally well remembered? At first, he was. Back in 1822, the hill upon which Captain William Flint had built his home was called Flint's Hill, but it was soon to be renamed Mount Sophia. Flint Street, at the foot of Flint's Hill, suffered the same fate when a later Captain of Commerce, a Mr. Princep, gently nudged him off his street sign. This was to avoid confusion with another Flint Street that ran between Battery Road and the Singapore River. However, changing Flint's Hill to Mount Sophia doesn't appear to have had an equally logical explanation. Like Alexander Johnston, Flint was a contemporary of Stamford Raffles. And in what was obviously a very good career move, he married Raffles' sister, Mary Ann. This more than likely helped him to secure the position of Singapore's first master attendant and harbour master. This placed him in charge of Singapore's imports and exports. But in addition, the captain of every ship to drop anchor in the harbour was required to report to him. Captain Flint's office stood somewhere over there, what in what is today Merlion Park. But later, a much grander master attendant's office was built across the river 
behind Empress Place. It probably stood on the site occupied by the Indochine restaurant today. A fabulous building, is it not? But sadly, I'm afraid it vanished a very long time ago. The structure behind it and to the left, however, is still with us. And after many renovations, it became our first Parliament House. Recently restored once more, it is now possibly the most attractive of our many art venues. Unless, of course, your taste tends more towards the uh, Durian School of Architecture. Let's turn the clock back again, 140 years, and take another look at the site as it was back then. The cluster of buildings right on the water to the left of what was to become Parliament House reminds me of a discovery I made at Fort Canning Cemetery last year whilst I was browsing amongst the tombstones inset into the walls. This is the gravestone of Mr. Stephen Hallpike, one of the earliest European inhabitants of this settlement who during his long life of active usefulness acquired the high respect of all who knew him. Now old Hallpike, he had a boatyard down on the river right in front of Empress Place and in many old photographs of Singapore you'll see this in the foreground. Very interesting, I didn't know that was here. Stephen Hallpike's boatyard was where Singapore's first ocean-going ship was built, the 196-ton brig Elizabeth and up until quite recently the lane that had once run through the boatyard was known as Hallpike Street. This is High Street in the last century, and Hallpike Street ran off it back there, just behind that splendid motor vehicle. But you'll find it a little hard to locate if you take a walk along High Street today. Now this used to be the Public Works Department, and Hallpike Street used to begin just about here. But like much of old Singapore, it simply vanished. And considering what replaced it, well, no one was about to argue, were they? Poor old Stephen Hallpike lost his street when they built the new Parliament House bang on top of it. So all he's got left to him by way of a permanent memorial is a tombstone up at Fort Canning. And Captain William Flint? Like Stephen Hallpike, he also briefly operated a boat building yard, but at Tanjong Ru. And 50 years ago, his name resurfaced on the prow of this boat, being ceremoniously launched at Tanjong Ru, the W. Flint. What became of the boat is long forgotten, but one hopes that Hallpike, Flint and Johnston won't be equally forgotten. There's admittedly little left of their presence or achievements at the river mouth, but in the settlement's early years, they were men who mattered and pioneers of progress. When I return, we'll embark upon a trip up the river in search of the Singapore of my youth. Davison of the river, unflinching in the face of the unknown, sets out alone on another voyage of discovery. Armed only with a cheese sandwich, he keeps a wary eye out for lurking crocodiles, aware that the river is full of nasty surprises. And there were some nasty surprises too. I can remember driving with my mother along the Esplanade when I was about five or six years old and coming to Anderson Bridge and it was completely jammed packed with people. I had to stop the car. We got out and said, what's going on? They said, oh, we've just seen a crocodile. Well, we had a look for the thing, couldn't see the beast. There you are, there were crocodiles back in the 60s. Well, of course, in those days, the whole of the river was packed with hundreds of boats. And there may have been 10 or 20,000 people actually living on the river or along its shores. And uh, as you might imagine, things got pretty nasty because there was only one place to empty the toilet pot, and that was over the side in the river. The writer Walter Harris, who visited Singapore in the 1930s, described it as one of the dirtiest and most evil-smelling rivers in the East. Similarly, Robert Foran, who was writing about the same time, described it as making its presence known through the agency of an original and abominable stench. And that's pretty much how I remember it back in the 1960s. The late 1920s was when the present concrete arched Elgin Bridge up ahead was constructed, 
and it was preceded by an earlier Elgin Bridge imported from Calcutta in 1863. If you're wondering about the name, well, it refers to the 8th Earl of Elgin, one Lord James Bruce, who was briefly the Governor General of India. Not many people know that. However, let's go back to even earlier times and hear what Julian's got to say about it all. In 1824, there was only a single bridge across the river, right here where Elgin Bridge now stands. And this connected North and South Bridge roads. It was a narrow, arched wooden structure for pedestrian traffic only, and it was called Presentiment Bridge. There had been a previous bridge on the site in 1819, a rather flimsy affair, and the first of a series of bridges to occupy what is the oldest bridge point in Singapore. Coleman Bridge had yet to be built, so here at Hill Street was pretty much the end of civilization as the British saw it. And as you can see on this 1824 map, all that was in the vicinity was Government House on the summit and the Assembly Hall at the foot of what's now called Fort Canning Hill. But within a century, civilization had arrived in a big way beyond Coleman Bridge. Bullock drays of Clark Quay were once a common sight along the riverbanks, but a more contemporary and less common sight is about to catch Julian's attention as his boat passes under Coleman Bridge. Clark Key has been restored and thus preserved for posterity, but quite why they had to disfigure the place with this rather ugly uh, amusement park ride, I can't quite figure out. Wouldn't it be better on St. Tosa? Julian's possibly right. However, history has its ups and downs, and so does reverse bungee jumping. Maybe there's a synergy going on here we haven't seriously considered. Just about over there was Ellenborough Market. It was built in 1845 and it was an elegant neo-baroque edifice. In those days it was called the New Market to distinguish it from Lao Passat. It was remodeled around the turn of the century but sadly was completely gutted by fire in 1968. When I was a child it was famous for its bakute stalls and also for duck rice. Renowned local photographer Marjorie Doggett made the market the subject of a photographic essay nearly half a century ago and captured the mood, the people and the place with perfection. Images that affectionately recapture riverside life at the busy market. Though the Ellenborough markets become a fading memory, across the river Clark Quay is still reassuringly with us pleasant reminder of what the river once was. I can remember walking around here in the late 70s when it was still a maze of little streets and old shop houses. I can distinctly recall some old guy sitting in a shop front wearing a white suit with a high mandarin collar, with a Fu Manchu moustache, doing his sums on an abacus. It was like something out of the 19th century. Shame it all had to go. Pulau Saigon went too. The island just downriver from Clark Quay was absorbed into the surrounding land and it's difficult to imagine today that an island indeed ever existed here. But there it is, or rather was. Vanishing go-downs joined vanishing islands and there are only three main groups left along this stretch of the river as far as I can see. The cluster beside the Riverview Hotel has served variously as clubs, restaurants and karaoke lounges over the years, but is presently vacant and looking a little worried about its future. Directly opposite them, along Saibu Road, are another unfortunate group of go-downs apparently headed for extinction. The only trio that appears to be flourishing houses the popular night spot Zook. So that fortunately guarantees at least one site's immediate survival. It can't be denied that today's Singapore River is an extremely attractive waterway. However, it might be even more so with the retention of another dozen historical go-downs along its banks. 
Well, we've reached the end of the river, and this is where it becomes a canal. The actual source, I believe, is in Mrs. Wong's bathtub in Bukit Merah. Warehouses and go-downs upriver from Clark Quay had been built mainly after 1880. In the later part of the 19th century, congestion had become a problem at the river mouth, but here land was more plentiful. Larger warehouses could be built for longer-term storage of goods, and it's this later vintage of building that time hasn't treated as kindly as its smaller cousins downriver. Of the few buildings remaining, many are slowly falling into disrepair. Given time, an easy argument could be made for their demolition as beyond practical preservation. But one sincerely hopes not. Singapore's architects have proven adept at creatively recycling many of the island's historical buildings. So the future of these go-downs needn't be as bleak as it might appear today. optimistic note, at least the Singapore River's glorious past has not been forgotten by the Singapore History Museum. So let's go upstairs and take a look. While the museum's closed for renovations and extensions at Stamford Road, it's taken up temporary residence here at Riverside Point, and it's staging a long-running exhibition that's quite appropriate in the circumstances. A History of the Singapore River, or River Tales. Right, thanks. Great, thanks. Well, this is certainly a very innovative approach to museum design. Oh, look, here's Mr. Johnston, looking rather bashful and cradling a photograph of a Japanese lady. Maybe there's more to Mr. Johnston than we read about in the history books. Ah, oh, John Little, my mother's favorite store. I think the hats were a little before her time, though. I've always rather liked the artwork on the old wire stages, a cross between a Japanese woodcut and Tintin. Triads, that's a forgotten aspect of our not so distant past. Though the History Museum has temporarily less floor space than in Stamford Road, don't be under the misapprehension that there isn't much to see. There is. Well, look, here's a wonderful model of a sailing ship. The Indiana, that's, that's the ship that uh, Raffles first came to Singapore. I really love scale models like that. Now this is rather interesting. It's a photograph of Boat Key taken in the 1860s from the north side of the river. But these are revolving panels and turn them around and you get to see what's there today. Rather neat. I'd love to spend some more time here, but actually we've got one more port of call on our river journey. And that's here at the Saligi Arts Centre building, splendidly restored as part of the arts housing initiatives of the mid-90s. Now, unfortunately, the exhibition is on the top floor. So while I tackle the stairs, why don't you guys check out next week's programme? And I'll see you at the top. In between a beach and queen refers to one of Singapore's earliest areas of colonial settlement centered around historical Middle Road. And it's seen a lot of changes over the past 30 years. But rest assured, as always, Julian's got a few surprises up his sleeve. Does anyone remember the old Empress Hotel? Because he's off to pay it a visit next week on Sight and Sound. The top floor of the Saligi Arts Centre is home to the Photographic Society of Singapore, a venerable institution which has been around since 1950. And we're in the Lo Kuan To Gallery. Now you may remember that this was the gentleman who headed up the Cathay organisation. But as well as being an astute businessman, he was also a very keen photographer. His favourite subject was photographing birds in their natural setting. But today we're here not for the wildlife, but for river life and the River Life exhibition is called Singapore River, a monochrome experience. A project undertaken by 11 of the society's members on their weekends off. Time clearly well spent. 
They're really very stunning images. I mean, take a look at this one. The, the camera lens focuses your eye in a way that real life doesn't. Quite astonishing. A slice of Manhattan set down at the mouth of the Singapore River. And this is at the other extreme. It has a timeless quality. Could have been photographed in the 1950s. The photographs involved use traditional shooting, processing and printing methods. Not all that different to those used by the original river photographers of 150 years ago. Like the images of yesteryear, perhaps these two will be an historical record in another 150 years time. So I'll leave you with these stunning images fresh in your minds. Maybe they'll encourage you to do something similar next time you're down on the river with a camera. You never know, you might just run into me down there doing likewise. Because for all the incredible changes that have taken place over the last 25 years, there's still something incredibly attractive about the place. The boats, the water, the sky, the reflections. Anyway, with that I'll say goodbye and see you next week. Take a look at another sun. Scheiße. It's that lunch, it's obviously had a bad effect here. Here is the same area today. <laughs> Yeah, we just wait for the howling gale to come. And back 180 years in time, and I can't remember what the last line is. <laughs> and take a look at the site as it was 140 years ago, which is not the line I'm going to be delivering. Hey, yeah. Why, why, why do you write such a complicated line? Mm -hmm.